Yeah, good afternoon. I'm uh, Norman Fenton and I'm here with Dr. Scott McLachlan. And we're going to be talking about the Lucy Letby case. Now, Lucy Letby, for those who don't know, is a nurse who's just recently been found guilty of seven counts of murder and seven counts of attempted murder of babies at the Countess of Chester Hospital during 2015 2016. And although the mainstream media is portraying her as Britain's most evil baby murderer, there are a few legal and other researchers who've seriously questioned the quality of evidence in the case and have suggested that there may have been systemic causes of the baby deaths at the hospital which were nothing to do with Lucy Letby. Now, Dr. Scott McLachlan is one such researcher. He completed his PhD on the topic of learning health systems under my supervision in 2019 at Queen Mary, University of London. And he's been following this case for a while now and is especially well qualified to comment on it. That's because in addition to his PhD, but also has several legal degrees and is currently a lecturer in digital technologies for health in the Division of Applied Technologies for Clinical Care with the Faculty of Nursing at King's College. So welcome. Scott. Now, before I ask the first question, I should say that what piqued my interest in the case recently was the chart that the prosecution used to show that Lucy was on shift at all the 17 baby collapses that the court examined, while the other nurses were only present at a few. And I put out a tweet saying that Scott had pointed out in his substack that there were baby deaths when Lucy Letby wasn't present. And I said, you can create exactly such a table for every specific nurse by restricting deaths to babies who die when that specific nurse is on duty. So Scott, can you tell us what you know about other similar baby deaths that happened in that Countess of Chester hospital during the time that Lucy was working there? And also whether there were any similar deaths shortly before and after she was there? Right, so what we, what we know historically for the hospital is, you know, on average they had two or three um, neonates die in the unit each year so there was a constant background noise there were there, there was the a regular um, a regular pattern and uh, so what was noticed in 2015 um, and 2016 was an abnormal increase in that pattern now um, what we see uh, through an, a freedom of information request that was uh, sent to the hospital uh, during last year what we can see is the hospital acknowledge that um, there were around 30 or 31 neonatal deaths on the unit during the during the two-year period that was investigated in the court case however Lucy only um, and that's the, that's deaths that's not collapses there were much more collapses than that but there were around 30 or 31 deaths um, however Lucy was only ever considered for eight of those deaths um, and as uh, many people will know right at the very start of the court case when the judge was reviewing the evidence that was being uh, that was going to be put before the jury um, the judge actually ordered that one of those cases be uh, removed from the docket and so the prosecution dropped one of the one of those eight babies now so what we know looking is that there were these 30 or 31 deaths that happened in that two-year period we know that um, some of those babies you always expect there to be a, a small background these are these are babies neonates who are often they're, they're very poorly when they're born um, they are often um, premature so many of these babies are anything from I, I think the, the uh, there, there were one or two that were almost term but the average sort of um, prematurity on the unit was something like seven weeks and it went as high as 10 or 12 um, Based on the prematurity of the baby and the weight of the baby, the unit were normally required to uh, refer the worst, the, 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 the babies who were the most premature, or the babies who were under 800 grams, they were required to refer those babies out to a more specialist unit. And then during that period, um, the Countess of Chester upgraded their unit so that they could keep some of the, the more severe, the, the more sickly babies. So you had a situation where you had a unit with a lot of babies um, and they were very busy you had staff who were supposed to be looking after those babies in a one-to-one -one relationship of, of staff to neonate and unfortunately for most of that period what we see is actually that uh, many of the staff were looking after two or sometimes three instead of one so you have a, a, a situation where the staff are working outside the guidelines and we therefore know that 
um, there were a much larger number of babies who died and so that chart that you posted which is a chart that um, the police presented a very very similar looking chart during the court case and they showed it to the jury on at least three occasions that that I saw um, the mainstream media have produced various versions of that chart really all that's all that's happened is their method of investigation to arrive at that chart has been to go and look at all of the babies who died and then filter that list down to the point where you've got a list where it's a hundred percent you've got a hundred percent Lucy in a column and so as you say quite rightly we could go and do that for any of the other 36 or so nurses who were on the unit and bear in mind that chart did not include the doctors right so imagine doing that for the doctors and you you could probably get the doctors to a range of 12 or 15 or even 18 of the 30 babies that um, expired on the unit if you did that for anyone else and you presented it you could go okay well look you know this person's correlated and in fact in one of my sub stacks I point to the fact that um, one of the nurses that worked with Lucy Letby was correlated with at least three of the four babies first four babies that I analyzed you know so why wasn't she in the frame for it why was it just that oh we've made a chart with Lucy I'm wondering whether what they did was started with all 30 babies and kept taking a, a baby out a baby out a baby out until they found the nurse that had the most correlations and went okay that's the nurse we're investigating and what about the numbers after Lucy let be well that's that's another interesting thing because when you when you look at it, it depends on who you source for the numbers so if you if you source the freedom of information that came from the, the hospital themselves um, there was a lull of about seven or so months between when Lucy was taken off the unit and when the next baby expired um, but then when you look at some of the other, you look at the Embrace report or you look at the ONS report for, for Chester, um, you see that from about May the following year, which is supposedly when the police investigation started, so May 2017, you start to see the number of deaths actually go up again. And they peak, uh, when you look at the ONS data, they peak um, in 2018-2019. Uh, at a rate that is actually slightly higher than when Lucy worked there. Well, wow, okay. Um, so can you tell me anything about the consultant, Dr. Gibbs, who I understand was in charge of the unit and what happened after he left? Well, there's, there's sort of some interesting uh, information that uh, I got when going through all of the sort of transcripts of evidence that were, the, this is the evidence that was presented in court by various different doctors and nurses. One of the things that struck me as I started to review um, even the first f sort of four or five babies, babies A through D and, a, and more recently baby E, when you, when you look at um, situations with the doctors, there's often talk of the doctors going and ringing, and these are junior doctors, so whilst by the time they got to court we were called the, in the court they were calling them consultants these were doctors who most of them were either trainee or they're in their first or second year out of out of um, getting their degree um, there's often talk of them going having to go and call dr gibbs right as in call him on the phone mm. and so you know we find a situation with one of the babies where the mother actually kept insisting that you know my baby's not right my baby's not right um, one of the doctors in the theater had said the baby looked like it had a, a infection and they actually gave the baby a, a bolus of antibiotics at the point where it was born in the theater um, and yet it took four to six hours for that child to be moved onto the neonatal ward and one of the interesting things was that the junior doctor who eventually moved the baby to the neonatal ward actually did say in his testimony that he had to go and phone Dr. Gibbs. Now, Dr. Gibbs ended up retiring um, not long after, in, in the sort of 18-month period after uh, Lucy Letby was removed from working at the hospital. Um, and it does seem like he was almost, you'd, you'd say, sort of one foot out the door for most of the period. And it does, it does feel from the evidence like the four junior doctors and there was a trainee doctor as well who was working there at the time it does feel like they almost had the run of the place and you feel they weren't sufficiently well qualified then 
it is it is pretty obvious from the evidence that we see that these doctors instead of being the the usual process would be for example you know I, I as you know while I was doing my PhD with you I had some eye surgery I had two eye operations and the usual process would be that you know yes you meet one of the junior doctors initially to have you know the, they, they do various tests and things on you you then meet with the consultant surgeon who's going to do the work um, the surgeon does the work and demonstrates to you know one or two of his or her registrars um, during the process of doing the surgery and then often what will happen is one of the registrars will see you after the surgery and then a few weeks later you'll see the consultant who will follow up and make sure that what they did was correct. What we see in this particular situation is we see for example in one case a trainee doctor who attempted to insert an umbilical venous catheter which is whilst it's not the easiest procedure it's not the most difficult um, and but the protocol says that you shouldn't do it more than three to five times before you go and get an actual consultant to come and do the job mm -hmm. um, and usually if you're a trainee you'd often be supervised a couple of times by a more senior doctor first yet we see instances where trainee doctors and doctors who were in their first year out of medical school were performing five six seven sometimes eight attempts before calling a more senior doctor to come and perform the insertion. Now one of the things that we do know is that when you're inserting these types of catheters and you're doing it multiple times and it's exactly why the protocol says don't do it too many times, you run the risk of introducing potential pathogens that are in the in the unit, you run the risk of harming the baby, um, you, you're basically inserting something into a line that goes directly from the umbilical to the baby's heart. So um, that's a pattern we see across the evidence for a lot of these infants is that there was multiple insertions done by junior doctors at the time um, and you know then these babies go on to have all of these other issues but instead of focusing on, okay, could the, you know, is it possible that something during all of these repeat over and over and over procedures mm -hmm. that did it? No, let's focus on the nurse who happened to be there at yeah. the end. You also had, I know, some serious concerns about the quality of the evidence presented by the expert witnesses in the case. That's another interesting area because um, it came out in it came out in uh, cross examination. Now the, the the police did quite well. The prosecution did quite well to present Dr. Evans as being. Uh, neonatal paediatric expert yet it came out in cross-examination that um, whilst he'd maybe done a short stint in a neonatal unit back in his very very early days as a paediatrician he not only was 15 years out of working he'd been retired for quite an extended period um, he'd only done the very barest minimum of neonatal work which therefore meant that he wasn't you know perhaps as uh, knowledgeable and competent in the neonatal area as he was perhaps in some of the other areas that he did work. Um, but also there was this issue that um, since retiring, um, Dr. Evans had set himself up and he set up a private company that specifically was him being a professional expert witness. He wasn't approached by the police, you know, will you come and have a look at this evidence? He admitted he actually drove from Wales all the way to Cheshire Police, presented himself to Cheshire Police and basically touted for business. You know, I'm here, I, I, I'm an expert in this, I can help you to find out the guilty party. So, um, you know, he turned up on the door, offered himself, um, it looks it looks as though from the, the, the um, tax returns to HMRC, that he's made considerable income from being involved in the investigation and being involved in the in the trial. You know, we can't uh, can't say for certain that the invoices that he declares are invoices that relate to this trial, but it does look as though he's made an income from this. And yet, uh, his evidence, in legal terms, what we'd probably class it as, is something called ipsy dixit, which is. It's opinion evidence because he's giving evidence about something, he's giving expert evidence for something that he's not actually an expert in. Scott, can you explain why you feel the defence in this case was somewhat inadequate? Right. So, um, Lucy's uh, defence attorney at the time has been a, a King's Council barrister called Ben Myers. Um, now, Ben has done, I think, uh, an admirable job in what I potentially believe are very difficult circumstances. 
I think something has happened along the way that has tied Ben's hands behind his back, that has limited either what he's allowed to investigate or limited the types of questions or the types of evidence he's allowed to challenge or present. Um, and I think that's evident in the fact that, well, like we discussed at the start, there were a whole group, there was two-thirds more babies uh, so the, the died on the unit in the period than Lucy was charged with. Normally what I would expect to see is that you would go and look at all of the babies and see, did any of those babies, and, and you'd want to do this both as a police investigating it and as the defence attorney trying to work out what the defence for your client is. Um, I would have expected that there would be some discussion about, okay, there's these other babies, um, some of the other babies um, we, we, we can already tell died in similar circumstances with some similar conditions they were ref referred out some of the babies were referred out to Arrow Park and Alderhay so there are records all over the place for them there are nurses in and midwives in both places who have interacted with these other babies so I would have expected to have seen something during the trial if not from the prosecution then definitely from the defense going well look there were a lot more babies that died why are we only focusing on these ones that can be pinned on Lucy and yet that never happened um, and then when you have a look towards the end, there was a, a spreadsheet that came out of the court that listed um, the witnesses that each party had declared. So it's, it's normal at the start of a trial like this that each party will declare to the court, these are the witnesses we intend to bring. And often you'll also present some sort of a will say statement for this is why we're bringing this person. Now, when you look at the, the list that was released um, back towards sort of October, November last year, um, the list for Lucy's defence mainly consisted of Lucy and her parents and people like that and, you know, with the plumber tacked on at the end. Now, in the end, the only witness that was presented on Lucy's behalf was the plumber. And so, you know, we, we didn't end up, we, we heard from Lucy, but we didn't end up hearing from her parents. We didn't end up hearing from any of the other nursing staff who apparently still support her. Um, she still has uh, many of the, the, the nurses she trained with and even some of the nurses that she worked with who are still supporting her. And, you know, we saw we saw one on television over the weekend who and, and was reported in the newspaper that she said, I'll never believe that, that this is true, that, that Lucy did this. So... Why didn't we hear from any of these people? Just picking up on that point about the plumber, because I, that was kind of like an interesting thing. Can you tell us a bit, a bit more about why the plumbing evidence was considered by the defence to be important? That's what I'm wondering, because it does. It didn't feel to me like um, like Ben invest like really uh, developed that particular witness. Now, the reason I say that is because what we do know from what the plumber said, and we know now there's, there's been some FOIs uh, to the hospital with regards to um, the records of the unit with regards to the maintenance and the plumbing. Mm. Um, what we know is that uh, there were regular instances, in fact, the plumbers were, were being called out, the maintenance people were being called out to the unit on about a weekly basis. Now, this is a, this is a, a two-story unit so you've got where the neonatal ward was which was in one corner of the hospital on the ground floor you've then got another unit which i believe was called ward 35 that sat on top now it was apparently quite common for the pipes that were in the ceiling space the the, the um, above the false ceiling in the neonatal unit for those pipes to have problems with uh, either being blocked or with um, micro fractures or bursts now why that's important is because these are wastewater pipes. These cast iron pipes are carrying um, fecal matter. They're carrying, um, you know, if somebody bleeds in the operating theater and, and parts of the operating theater get cleaned up, then that's going down a drain in the mm. floor and that drain's passing across. And we know from the evidence um, from the plumber that uh, originally the drain from that unit upstairs ran across the middle of the this floating ceiling above the neonatal room one so at the point where that was having little micro leaks and where it um, had a, a more major significant leak and it was getting blocked um, you're talking about a pipe that is directly above the cots that these neonates were sleeping in now you might not think that that's important except that what we know from other hospitals who've experienced issues with hospital wastewater is that hospital wastewater 
um, carries and breeds a number of pathogens. Some of them are bacterial and some of them are viral. So we're talking about things like Acinetobacter, uh, we're talking about uh, endotoxins and endoviruses. And these things, so these are the things that um, in some cases you will see normally you or I would have some of these things inside us. But while ever they're in the parts of our body where they're supposed to be, where they're normal, um, such as in our intestines, they don't cause us any problem. It's when they end up somewhere else. And in this particular instance, what we know is that if you've got these hospital pathogens that are getting out into the environment, they can not only survive and create a film across surfaces. So for example, if you would pulled down those, those floating ceiling tiles, you might very well have seen a thin film of these pathogens growing on the inner surface. Um, but we also know, for example, that even in, and one of the examples I give on my substack is that even in a brand new unit that was built, so um, the example I give is a hospital that was built, they built a brand new neonatal unit, had everything brand new, new plumbing, new surfaces, new tiling, new floors, the whole lot. From the time that the builders got sign off on that they'd done everything that they needed to do to the time when the ward staff came in and started setting up the ward was 30 days. In that 30 days, in that brand new unit, one of these pathogens had taken hold inside the plumbing, the cold water, the fresh water plumbing coming into a sink. That pathogen then resulted in the deaths of a number of babies, oh. right, in that brand new hospital unit, simply because once that pathogen had gotten into that um, that particular set of piping, it grew and grew and grew. And of course, you know, as more water's coming through, that water's washing it out. It's being washed onto the nurse's hands when they're washing their hands. They're using the water from the, the from mm. this source to do things like mix the, the feeds that are given to the babies. And so it led to a number of deaths. Now, an interesting story behind that was that when they initially started looking at those deaths, they did the same thing that happened in Chester. They looked at what nurses hmm. can we can we link? Yeah, and it was it wasn't until they started testing they they brought in a, um, a um, uh, epidemiologist and his team who's an academic team who came through and they started testing all the surfaces all the taps etc. And that was when they found it that it was actually in this fresh water tap. So presumably in the in the Lucy Lepi case there wasn't there was no such sort of forensic investigation of the surfaces. There is no evidence from the court case, and there's no evidence from the hospital records that they ever they, they didn't investigate tested that, to so see whether, despite the fact that there were these known problems of the sewage. Well, this, despite the fact they'd up. they'd not only had sewage leaking in that no. that space above, but they'd also, by the plumber's ad, uh, own admission and by Lucy's evidence, which led to the plumber mm. being there, they'd also had. Um, hospital wastewater from the toilets etc mixing with the wastewater from the showers and it came up through the floor mm. such that at one point they were walking through it and and if i understand it correctly that the plumber said he was they were more or less being called in on a weekly basis and the yes and the prosecution tried to um dismiss this as well that happens in any hospital would that be the, do you think that would be the case the way that the the way that the prosecution sought to actually um I suppose sort of deflect from it was the prosecution at one point um, on on redirect, which is what you do after the the person's been cross examined. Mm. The prosecution sought to um, oh well you know it happened in the room next door so it, you know that won't have affected this room. Right. Know. Okay. Um, so one another of the examples that I give on my Substack is the fact that um, on more than one occasion we've seen situations where patients have been found to. Um, become infected with these nosocomial pathogens even when the pathogen is found on the opposite side of the hospital and it's taken an investigation again an epidemiological investigation to find what is the route that the pathogen took through the hospital to eventually end up at the patient who's over here okay so this sort of leads into my next que next question because basically the jury of course found were convinced that, that Lucy Letby was guilty so if she wasn't guilty what other possible explanations might there be for the deaths of these babies is it the case that are you proposing that these these p potential pathogens were was one such explanation and are there any others as well well there's 
potentially I've I focused my research at the moment specifically on a group of very common bacterial pathogens and I know that there's another researcher at the moment who's looking at a pair of very very common viral the the, the intervirus type um, because at the um, within the sort of a year or two either side of these deaths um, there was antivirus found in two other hospitals in the UK to, to, to have become an infestation. Mm. So um, the reason that I focused my own study on the bacterial pathogens is that the various symptoms that we're looking at for these children, so we're, we're talking about the fact that Lucy's been accused of injecting them with air um, on the basis that, not because anyone saw her, because nobody saw her inject a baby with air, She's been accused of injecting them with air on the basis that air was found either in their abdomen or in the space outside their abdomen, or in one case, in the space um, that is sort of right towards the back, um, which is near the spine. Okay, so she's been accused of injecting air and that somehow the air has traveled to wherever it was hmm. supposedly found later. The interesting thing is that several of the bacterial pathogens that I started to investigate, that I've written about on my substack, have um, as symptoms that have been recorded in other neonates caused air to be either um, collecting in the duodenum and the uh, small intestine, or they've caused air to get into the blood vessels and travel outside of the the actual, you know, intestine itself. So into the into the bloodstream, into um, what we call the portal veins, the veins that then take the blood from from the intestines and run it through the liver. Um, or they've been seen in 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 even even more severe cases to have caused air to got to get into the bloodstream and travel to the heart or to travel to the lungs. So these are these are things that are documented. They're in the academic literature. Um, and so there are examples out there if anyone wanted to look for them. Similarly, um, at least two of the three bacterial pathogens that I looked at um, are known to cause this what we call purpura, the, the little purple spots that they keep talking about. Mm. So when they start talking about, oh, there was these little purple spots that came up either on the abdomen or on the, on the extremities, so on the hands and feet, well, two of the pathogens I looked at actually do have a known history for causing these purpura to, to come up on the skin and they also disappear and or self-resolve as we say um, within sort of anything from one to four hours or you know maybe maybe by the end of a shift a nurse will go back and go oh the spots have disappeared so many of the symptoms that are discussed for each of the babies you can actually go back and look at these bacterial pathogens mm and find that these bacterial pathogens, especially when they, they get to the point of causing a condition called NEC, which is um, you know, necrotizing mm. um, enterocolitis, when they get to that point, which is the deadly point that, that mirrors almost some of these... Um, uh, you, you heard during the trial that, oh, these babies, they, they crashed and it was an unexpected crash. Well, NEC is known for resulting in these right. unexpected crashes. That's why we call it a crash. You know, things stop yeah. working. So, um, d again, these bacterial pathogens cause NEC or can cause NEC, mm. which then can cause these unexpected crashes with all of these other symptoms that okay. were discussed. So... And of course, none of that um, type of no, no hypothesis like that was presented to the uh, jury. Thus, thus far through the transcripts that I've read, and yeah, I'm, okay. a, I'm, a, I'm a between a half and two thirds of the way through critically okay. examining the transcripts, it's never been mentioned. Okay, so but of course the jury um, did find her guilty of seven murders and mm. seven or six, depending on which newspapers you read, uh, mm. attempted murders. What do you think was the most convincing piece of evidence against against her presented in the case? I mean, it, there was this. Yeah. There was some if we talk were, of this, some sort of written confession or something like that. Can you say something about that? Yeah. So there's 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 a there's a couple of things. You know, we've got that table that we discussed before. Mm. Then we've got um, we've got an interesting thing, which is that they the the police talked about the fact that when they went to Lucy's home, they found that she had about a hundred days worth of handover sheets. Now, that's really 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 common. You know, I, I want people to understand out there 
that it is actually quite common for nurses to have a handover sheet you know so you get you go in you start your shift the first 20 minutes half an hour you do handover so the nurse who's been looking after the patients that you're going to be taking for the day will tell you you know these are all of the things that we've done with these patients these are the medications this is when things are due the doctor's going to mm-hmm. visit at 10 o'clock that's so you write it all down on a sheet now some nurses will have a pre a, a, a very well set out predefined template that they use other nurses will literally just get a piece of paper from the photocopier and write on the back of it now it is very very common for a lot of nurses to have that sheet folded up in their pocket some nurses might give it to the next person they hand over to but it's very common for nurses to take those sheets home now one of the reasons that um, we quite often recommend that they take it home goes back to cases like the Lucia de Burke case because one of the things that came out that helped to demonstrate that there were problems with the patients that she was looking after and that it therefore wasn't murder and why she was acquitted is the fact that she actually had the handover sheets to show these are all the things I was told about the patient Mm -hmm. and this is what I treated the patient for right so it's quite often and you know when I talk to uh, you know I I personally tutor um, nursing students right when I talk to them I tell them have a handover sheet have it organized so that you've always got the same information about your patients in the same place every day fold that thing up take it home and keep it it is also common that for example if you've got a patient who's got critical care needs it is not uncommon for you to get a phone call the next day halfway through the next shift so you've been there all night somebody Mm. rings you up at 10 or 11 o'clock and says look you know this this patient has had this problem and this problem and this problem um do you recall whether or not the doctor saw them last night or do you recall whether they were given this medicine Mm. the only way you're going to remember that properly is to be able to pull your sheet out and go yes actually i ticked that off on the box yeah so why was it the fact why was the fact that she had all of these sheets at home considered by the police to be a case for the prosecution well they thought they thought that she, what she was doing what, what they allege was that what she was doing was keeping them sort of almost as trophies ah okay. right okay. so they were alleging she was keeping that as trophies right. okay. and what i'm saying is well yeah. no actually yeah. okay. I, I, I can guarantee you that um yeah. you know I, I know lots of nurses i know lots yeah. of midwives many of the okay. nurses it's standard I practice okay then what about this written note that was used against her okay so another another thing that the nurses and midwives are required to do during their training is to keep what are called a reflective journal okay so when they go out on practice and it's one of the things that in the last two or three weeks actually i've had to read some of the reflective journals for the students that i supervise they go out on their placement they spend so many weeks on a ward Each day as they do a procedure or as they learn about a new medical condition, they keep a reflective diary about it. So they write down, you know, and they not only do they write down about the medical condition or the treatment that they performed, they might write down comments. You know, we usually encourage them to write down comments about, you know, what did you find easy on the unit? What did you find difficult? How was it working with these different types of people? You know, the doctors, the nurses, whatever. So it's it's it becomes this thing that at the end of their placement, we can look at and we can understand you know here's what happened for the student Mm. now when they go out they get qualified with nmc every sort of couple of years and here it's uh, i believe it's three years in the uk Um, australia and new zealand it's sometimes three years and sometimes five years depending on your qualification you are required to submit a whole heap of documentation to then get re-up your practicing certificate to, mm-hmm. you know, so you've got to show that you've done certain types of training. Um, you've got to demonstrate that you know you've done certain number of hours of, of actual work in a particular thing to keep a particular scope of practice. But one of the things you also still have to do is write reflective notes about a couple of patients mm-hmm. to be able to to be able to present and go. Here's a reflective note that describes the path of treatment and the, and the care that I provided for this pa- patient over the course of a week when they were on my unit. Yep right so writing these sort of reflective journal things does become something that nurses and midwives often do Mm -hmm. okay not only that but you've got the fact that you know a lot of nurses and midwives obviously are girls a lot of girls a lot more girls than guys tend to keep a journal or a diary Mm -hmm. or something like that 
what we see from looking at the various screenshots of the ones that, that were shown in court is the the police have gone through and they've picked the two or three and there's especially this one green one they've picked the two or three that appear to be the most damning and then they've focused on a couple of words right. you know maybe three or four or five words where she's written something like you know i must be evil or i am evil um i i i, I, I must have killed them or i killed them she's written words like mm-hmm. that but when you read the whole note in context what you see is a young girl who is almost beating herself up she's she's self-flagellating she's whipping herself you see a young girl who seems to think that had i have been a better nurse had i been a smarter nurse had i have had more training or had i had i been a better person i could have saved these babies and when you when you read the whole note and you think about the psychology of what she's written that's what she's doing she's she's taking to herself taking herself to task and blaming herself mm-hmm. yeah okay so it was basically a sort of a cherry picking exercise it may have been by the police yeah for all the journals okay. i i, I but, wouldn't mind i wouldn't mind betting that the police mm-hmm. found hundreds of pages and in fact they do allude to the fact that they found considerable amount of journal material yeah but what were we shown all, all told as far as i've seen so far in the transcripts only three pages were ever shown yes it's this this case where they're they're ignoring the absence of evidence in all of the other material exactly which in itself actually is not evidence of absence but anyway that's a separate thing but okay so finally you obviously believe that there presumably are grounds for an appeal hmm. and if so what would be the next steps what happens next well i th- i think what's what needs to happen is somebody with uh, you know obviously a barrister and a team with appeal experience need to come in and i say that i say that quite cautiously um i i think there's one of the potential arguments on appeal could very well end up being unless unless we can show why it seems ben meyer's hands were tied behind his back why why you know whether she tied his hands behind his back whether the judge in voir dire tied his hands behind his back or whether um as we've since seen there were a couple of nhs lawyers in the court most of the time whether they've tied his hands behind his back i don't know what that what that backstory is because all of that that sort of voir dire stuff happens behind closed doors Mm -hmm. okay so it possibly could end up being that one of the appeal grounds could be trial counsel competence that's not to say ben was incompetent but that's to say that that's a way in to get an appeal is to say well look you know it's clear that her defense was wanting there was something wanting about this defense there's a whole lot of stuff there's questions that weren't answered now it ne- so it needs counsel who are experienced on appeals because it, uh, appeals on their own are a very tricky and very specific area of um, jurisprudence in the same way that you wouldn't let a podiatrist operate on your eye you know you wouldn't necessarily go and pick yep. the average solicitor to do your appeal now obviously as well i think there's probably no money and i think that's going to be a limiting factor because yep. often with appeals it's the person who's got the money to bring the appeal because in on in an appeal situation whilst you might only have a, a defendant often only has some people say 30 percent, some people say 10 percent chance of winning in the lower court when you get to the appeal court um that starts to get bigger it might be 30 percent. it might go all the way up to about 60 percent chance for the defendant but you've got to have the money you've got to have the situation where you can make the arguments that are required so we need the right people we need obviously to be able to either either those people are going to have to donate their time or we're going to have to find a way to fund them and then the these various issues that are the the holes that are starting to come up in the case are going to be the things like there's going to have to be um if if the evidence of the other babies that died that lucy wasn't blamed for if the evidence regarding those babies wasn't handed over during discovery then that's a discovery issue and so whoever does her appeal is going to have to go back and go right if these babies weren't disclosed during discovery to ben myers then that's grounds for appeal in and of itself and those records are going to have to be gotten and then suitably qualified people are going to have to be brought in to look through those records and go right if you've got the seven babies that lucy's now 
found guilty of murdering and you've then got another seven babies out of that 30 who died in similar circumstances but Lucy was never anywhere near them you've then got a situation where how can you continue to hold Lucy guilty for the seven babies on such circumstantial evidence if we find yep. that some of the other babies died the same way yeah okay well thanks very much let's hope that justice is seen mm. to be done at the end of the day yeah. and thanks for the conversation thank you